as we go through this each week, you know, you're getting a different variation. You, the students of plasma, get a different iteration of of this process, and I hope that you enjoy all components of it. Welcome to our fourth plasma event of this 2024 plasma series. My name is Elia Vargas. I'm a visiting assistant professor in the Department of Media Study, and I am this year's curator of the plasma series. Plasma, performance, lectures, and screenings by media artists is sponsored by the university at Buffalo's Department of Media Study, and funding is provided by the Office of the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. It is a public speaker series that brings innovative and celebrated artists from a national and international context to the Buffalo area. It is also a course that exposes new and experimental forms of media arts to undergraduate students here at UB and in the Department of Media Study. For the students in the course, kind of as I said a moment ago, this might feel entirely pedestrian. But as you've noticed, these introductions vary each month. And also maybe, as you notice, I sort of prefer to speak off the cuff rather than via a pre-written introduction, but sometimes times call for different measures. So speaking of and to you students, uh, please take out your sign-in devices. Your sign-in for the start of class is already open. And uh, please write the name of this evening's film, Spaces of Exception, uh, for week five module. Before I introduce the film and the filmmaker, I would like to extend my thanks. Is it not open yet? It is open, okay, just general mumbling. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Exception. Oh, you'll learn all about this. Just you wait. So before I introduce the film, and the filmmaker, writer, organizer behind it, I would like to extend a thank you to, to numerous people. Thank you uh, to Jason Livingston for typing a specific set of email addresses in a shared note and pressing send. You helped make this all happen. And thank you for your hosting capacities. Uh, thank you to Ekram and Squeaky Wheels for extending the number of events available to Matt. Thank you to Burning Books. Uh, Burning Books is here. You all may have seen them at the beginning when you walked in uh, with a book for sale written by Matt, our speaker tonight, and who will also be having more events at Burning Books uh, later on this week. Uh, thank you for your participation in making this event possible. It, it takes a village to make such an event possible sometimes. And I'm uh, really grateful to everyone who's worked to make to make this particular event happen, and that includes the uh, Department of Media Study technical support that's been here each week to help us with our various audiovisual streaming media needs. Thank you all. Uh, lastly, thanks, Chris, our teaching assistant uh, for the general uh, 
support of all things. Tonight's screening, Spaces of Exception, investigates and juxtaposes the struggles, communities, and spaces of the American Indian Reservation and the Palestinian refugee camp. The film was shot from 2014 to 2017 in Arizona, New Mexico, New York, and South Dakota, as well as in Lebanon and the West Bank. Directed by Matt Peterson and Malik Razamni, it is an attempt to understand the significance of the land, its memory and divisions, and the conditions for life, community, and sovereignty. Spaces of Exceptions comes out of the long-term multimedia project, The Native and the Refuge, which has been presented in Canada, Denmark, Ecuador, England, France, Guatemala, Italy, Jordan, Lebanon, Palestine, Portugal, Syria, Turkey, and the United Arab Emirates within the refugee camps and reservations where the film was shot and at venues including cinemas, museums, and universities. With us tonight, co-director of Spaces of Exception, Matt Peterson, is an organizer at Woodbine, an experimental space in New York City. He directed the documentary features Scenes from a Revolt Sustained in 2015 and Spaces of Exception 2019, and co-edited the books In the Name of the People, The Mohawk Warrior Society, and The Reservoir. Since 2014, he has collaborated with Malik Razamni on the Native and the Refuge, of uh, the Native and the Refugee, a multimedia documentary project on American Indian reservations and Palestinian refugee camps. At the risk of stealing some of Matt's thunder, in a 2021 interview on Spaces of Exception with Eflux Journal, Matt and Malik said, to the extent that people know about reservations and camps, it is often by reading or hearing from people who do not live in those spaces. So this was the obvious beginning for us methodologically. We didn't want to try to learn about these spaces at a library or university or governmental office, but to see and document and learn from people who inhabit them. Our aesthetic objective was to directly place the audience into the thick of these spaces, to immerse them in their sights, sounds, architecture, movement, and characters with minimal outside references. Normative, narrative, and conceptual tropes of documentary cinema are aimed at helping audiences digest the images but often end up making sense of these images on behalf of the audiences. Our idea was that in the absence of those conventions, our audience would have a more visceral and raw, but also more engaged and ultimately thoughtful relationship with what they were seeing and hearing. Over the next two hours, I certainly hope you endeavor for a thoughtful relationship with seeing and hearing. I think this film asks nothing less of us. Please welcome Matt Peterson. Hey guys, thanks a lot for having me. I'm really happy to be here. Um, just on a personal level, when I was maybe about 30, 35 years ago, um, 
a formative part in forming, you know, my identity and personhood and subjectivity was uh, deciding on something. And there was something I heard about or read about or saw on TV in the news, this thing called uh, the no huddle offense, which was this kind of uh, intervention and spontaneity and improvisation that originated here in Buffalo. And uh, the, the Bills, I'm from New York City, but the Bills taught me a lot about learning about loss, learning about patience, learning about uh, delayed gratification, um, learning about a kind of resilient uh, temporality about uh, victory. And I think all of those things are applicable to different political uh, and artistic sensibilities. So I have a kind of personal you know, affinity towards Buffalo and I'm happy to be here. Um, there's a number of events throughout the week. Um, including at the squeaky wheel and happy uh, excuse me at burning books as well and i'm happy that this book is here so another aspect that i want to talk or think about is uh, i know since october 7th these questions around the things that we're going to talk and think about in this film have become quite uh, polemical and volatile and controversial on college campuses i'm not here i'm not sure to the extent to which that's been true here at uh the University of Buffalo, but I'd like to hear, and maybe we could talk about it. But just in the last few months, you know, we've screened the film at Rutgers University, which is a, a public college in New Jersey. New Jersey has the second largest Arab population to Michigan, and there's a large Palestinian population uh, who goes to Rutgers. And the Students for Justice in Palestine was um, was banned at Rutgers shortly after we screened the film. Uh, we screened the film at uh, the University of Indiana in Bloomington. There was a, a scheduled art exhibition by a Palestinian tenured professor that was canceled for security reasons around the time that we screened the film. Uh, a professor, tenured professor, reserved a room for a Students in Justice in Palestine meeting and was uh, suspended for doing so, for not following uh, appropriate protocols. Uh, where I live in New York, Columbia University banned both Jewish Voice for Peace and Students for Justice in Palestine. Uh, one of the first screenings we did after October was in Middlebury in Vermont, and a number of Palestinian students were shot there um, by a, a damaged, deranged individual. So, and you know, there's been a number of kind of, yeah, quite severe, volatile discourse and rhetoric, censorship, repression around this question, I think, also among arts institutions, Art Forum, Berlinale uh, right now is going through difficult dynamics to think about what it is about this question of Palestine that that is a kind of an edge or a litmus test beyond which boards of directors or administrators or whatever can't really go further. I think sometimes we think the arts or media as a kind of continuum and there's kind of different there's a grassroots there's an independent there's a medium level there's the kind of upper echelon institutions like the new york times or columbia art forum but then what we've been seeing the last four months is this kind of this wall that is kind of unable and we're kind of separated from it. we're blocked or whatever and thinking about why that is also you know as a new york city resident i share a governor with y'all who I believe is from here in Buffalo and she's said some quite um, difficult things in the last week talking about um, I think wiping Canada off the map um, is something she said if there was an equivalent attack of Canada to Buffalo and thinking about that in context and thinking about you know we're here at this university and you know now in Gaza there are no universities all of the universities have been destroyed They've been bombed by by Israel. There's no school. School has been canceled in Gaza since November. There's no school ongoing. There's no classrooms. There's no sign-ins or something. And so I think as we watch the film and think about that context for what it means for us to be us here in this in this nice auditorium and in this university and think about what we're seeing, um, just to kind of put that out there and put that in there. And, and I hope that'll come back uh, in the discussion afterwards. This project, I started with a Lebanese artist and scholar 10 years ago, Malik Rasamni, and it's been to juxtapose and think about the American Indian Reservation and the Palestinian refugee camp, to think about the process and logic and technique and technology of settler colonialism, of state formation of both the United States and Israel, 
and then thinking about the reservation and the refugee camp of these these spaces that exist uh, outside of that process, the state formation. So the indigenous we might think of as a pre-state kind of category phenomenon. They exist before citizenship, but are sort of left over in the state that kind of comes upon it. The refugee might we, we might think of as a post post state, a post citizenship phenomenon. So these different temporalities, these excesses of of what the state is, and then the reservation and the refugee camp are these lived, ongoing, contemporary realities that don't fit in the governance, that don't fit in the administration, the kind of mentality of what these states are. And that was for us, for Malik and I, to think about examining, visiting, documenting, meeting people in these spaces. So the film is in five parts. It alternates between reservations and refugee camps. The film is 90 minutes, and uh, we'll have a discussion after. We weren't able to visit um, Syria because it was the height of the civil war, but there's Palestinian refugee camps within Syria, which also were at some of the front lines of being destroyed in the in the early years of that war in Gaza because of the the siege and the blockade. We also weren't able to visit to, to include it in the film. But I just want to mention, you know, Gaza itself is two thirds refugees, which is to say that um, of the 2.5 million people who currently live there, they're not native Gazans. They're not from what is now Gaza. They're from what is now called Israel, but are living as refugees in, in Palestine, in the occupied territories. And what we've been seeing recently is, you know, direct kind of bombardment and attacks on refugee camps. And you'll see the refugee camps we do visit in the West Bank and Lebanon. And in the last 75 years, the ways in which they've been constructed with kind of primitive, crude materials, building materials, because they are meant to be a temporary um, refuge for people to live in while this kind of question of Palestinian self-determination was resolved. And, you know, as 75 years have been going on and it still remains unresolved, but the buildings will remain quite crude. So to imagine when you're seeing the kinds of buildings you'll see in the film, imagine what aerial bombardment does to these buildings and the densities of the people living in there, et cetera. The other question is, you know, there's been this polemic, especially in college campuses, of this phrase, you know, from the river to the sea and what that means. You know, last month, though, Netanyahu himself said he can't imagine any future for Israeli security that doesn't include uh, complete Israeli sovereignty from the river to the sea, right? So if that means that what's officially called the occupied territories of Gaza and the West Bank are permanently under Israeli sovereignty, they then become something like reservations, right? There are these places within Israeli governance that are not Palestinian, but they're not quite Israeli. They're reserved for these other populations that don't quite fit in, right? And then thinking about that, as we watch the film, I think it's interesting to reflect on the testimonies, the commentary, the analysis you'll hear from Pine Ridge, from Akwesasne, from the Navajo Nation about these reservations and their histories of militaristic colonial domination and think about how it informs what we're seeing on the news from Gaza, what we're seeing in social media, what we're seeing of this experience, seeing of the fact that there's no universities, there's no schools, hospitals have been bombed, what does it mean that these reservations and refugee camps continue to exist in the United States and Israel and elsewhere? And how does, you know, Gaza not being in the film, but in our minds, and how do we bring it into the room? So that's one of the things I'd like to kind of think about or talk about um, afterwards and like to hear from you about. But thank you again, everyone, for coming. Thank you for having me. Thanks for, for being here. I'm really happy to uh, discuss this project with you. Thanks.
Thank you, Matt. Would you yeah. like to go directly into questions? Yeah. Yeah, if people have any questions, comments, responses. Thank you. Um, I wanted to know, um, have you ever been to Palestine before? Prior to the project? Yes. No, not prior to the project. Oh, okay. Yeah. What got you interested in, in um, the uh, Palestine and the uh, uh, Native Indian um, issues, if you don't mind me asking? So my collaborator is Lebanese and grew up partly there in Lebanon, Beirut. And um, he had been talking about this phenomenon of the Palestinian refugee camps within and around Beirut and how he felt like they were these spaces that he didn't really understand or know much about or had never been to. And then when we were in New York City, a friend of ours um, from Europe actually came and she was asking about, this was maybe like 2012, 2013. She was like, oh, what's going on you know, with Indians in America? And we kind of realized, because Malik also grew up here, we're like, oh, you know, to be honest, we don't really know much. You know, we don't really know what's going on in the reservations. And then we just started to think about the resonance between those two dual experiences, being a Lebanese citizen or an American citizen, and that these places existed within our countries, but outside of our frame of reference, or outside of our, even as a leftist, I think, prior to, there was I Don't Know More in 2013 and then Standing Rock in 2016, which brought a lot more visibility to Native struggles or something. But prior to that point, I think it was a bit more obscure, opaque um, for a lot of us. And actually in New York City, I don't know about here in Buffalo, but I think there was also this dynamic where a lot of New Yorkers or Americans or leftists knew more about Palestine than they did about Native America. They could maybe name some Palestinian organizers, organizations, novelists, filmmakers, artists, writers, regions, cities, et cetera. Whereas if you were to ask them the same, to do the same about Native America, they probably couldn't, including to some degree ourselves. So this was something also to think about this sort of invisibility or erasure of native life in america and, and how that happened and why that happened and what that means so yeah uh, small question but i noticed that you do a lot of interviews that follow people as they walk is there a reason for that yeah, we decided to use that as a kind of visual motif throughout the film, um, partly as a way because the film is about these these places or these spaces, and we wanted to do visual portraits of the places, so not just the individuals living in them, but what do those spaces look like and feel like? How do you navigate them? And then it was also a methodological question because the way we made it was kind of in collaboration with the people so we would ask them why don't you show us around you know what you think we should see or what you think we should feel we should film um so we kind of just documented those paths or walking or driving or whatever so it's partly a document of that methodological question but also as a way to showcase the place itself um was part of why we did it but yeah Hello. Uh, one thing that you talked about um, on the in the film is you p put a lot of parallels between Native America and then uh, the occupation that's ongoing in Palestine. Um, in your opinion, what did you glean from these two observations in terms of similarities or differences that you found particularly interesting? Um. I mean, I think right now, since October, like I tried to mention in the beginning, what's interesting is now when I rewatch 
Pine Ridge or Akwesasne and thinking about the ways in which their testimonies resonate with what you see or hear from Gaza, the way in which the kind of prisoner of war camp, the kind of militarization, kind of domination or something. And I think that's something. There's obviously a lot of differences, and the project is not to say they're the same. It's just to juxtapose them. And in the process of juxtaposing them to see what emerges from doing so, you know, there's this kind of um, kind of concept in editing or montage, you know, when you put two images next to each other, a third one emerges that's not in either of them, you know? So part of the project, it was this kind of montage or something where, you know, there's lots of documentaries about Palestine and there's lots of documentaries about Native Americans, but by putting them next to each other, by combining them in one film, part of what we were trying to do is to think about what emerges from that that montage or something, you know. And then historically, as, you know, as things are changing, as Standing Rock emerges or as this, as what we're seeing, this genocidal violence in Gaza emerges, that's a new kind of image, let's say, that kind of brings a new meaning to what we're seeing. So I think watching this film the last four months is a new way in which to kind of derive meaning from the testimonies that you're hearing in different places from different people. Hi. Um, so I noticed in the film that the quotes didn't have any names, like, like who said it. And I was kind of just wondering if that was like intentional, like on purpose, because I, f I feel like maybe there wasn't any names because it was more of like a general thing that the people said themselves, because I also noticed in the film that, um, the quotes were also said by the people themselves in those communities. And so I'm just wondering like, if it was a specific person or if it was more like a general, like, oh, this is what the community says, you know? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, part of the, there's a few, a few reasons for that. I mean, one, it was definitely intentional. Partly we were kind of reacting to a certain trend within documentary which can be a bit more journalistic or kind of human interest which follows the stories of individuals or characters or something or you know something like this there'll be say three people and it'll follow there and it'll be some kind of heartwarming story of some youth girls soccer team or something and we'll follow her you know getting dressed and putting on the soccer shoes and stuff like that and we wanted to kind of resist that and have a more analytical frame of like the testimonies and the experiences of those people rather than a biographical portrait of any particular individuals um so we didn't really ask them about themselves in that way you know we asked them we hoped to try to analyze the condition of refugeehood and indigeneity in these in these contexts or something and then we also just felt like because that was our approach and it's this kind of collage of all these voices and people if we put all the names it would be like 75 names or something and would you really like remember who the name it might be kind of distracting or confusing or annoying and we just wanted a kind of more visual portrait that you could kind of enter into and as you're seeing the place you know like like someone asked you're kind of hearing the testimony or analysis of the place and you know we also decided we didn't use really any archival footage aside from the opening montage, so everything's contemporary. It's not like this historic overview. It's contemporary portraits of the places. And all the people we speak to live and work in those places. There's not like, we don't talk to, you know, academics or journalists or experts or people in offices or government officials. We don't talk to any Americans or Israelis. You know, it's just the people who live inside the reservation, the refugee camp that we're filming in. We also don't cut between them. You know, we, it's their self-contained episodic units or something. We don't cut between Pine Ridge and the West Bank and back. And, you know, so there's a, we tried to have an integrity of the place and then the, all the analysis is of that place or something. So. I mean, that may or may not have worked, you know, cinematically, but that's what we did. That's what we were trying. That's what we were thinking of, you know, so 
as you're watching, you get a kind of tight, contained, experiential, testimonial, immersive, you know, portrait of these places or something. And then you juxtapose them and hope, see what that means. And then showing it now in February 2024, seeing what that means and what that does, you know. So um, were there like any particular concerns about safety of yourself or your crew as you were filming or perhaps um, about the people that you were interviewing? Yeah, I think um, on the on the reservation side, no, we went to Standing Rock. So as part of this is a long-term multimedia project that we've been doing now for 10 years. We've made a dozen short films that are not this, that are separate from this, including the book back there, the Mohawk Warrior Society is a book that we kind of edited out of the collaborations with the people in the middle section, the elders from and around Akwesasne. But um, we went to Standing Rock a couple of times in the midst of working on the project. We made two short films there and there was more kind of confrontation or clashes there then there were, you know, part of the project was to think about the everydayness of these places. So not, we weren't like following events or ruptures or uprising. We wanted to know like the daily, banal, everyday life of the places. But in the West Bank, that daily life includes direct confrontation with the IDF, you know, her active occupying, you know, colonial force. And we weren't seeking it out but you know an individual you know a young kid was killed just when we happened to show up so that sort of happened and then while we were in the west bank you know we if not directly we smelled tear gas on a daily basis you know that just everywhere we went there were clashes somewhere somehow there was you know some live ammunition some flashbangs some tear gas or something but that was sort of unavoidable because the different spatial and temporal dynamics of colonization has different fronts let's say you know and the west bank is still a certain kind of front and of course gaza now is the extreme extreme militarized front you know before october 7th gaza was you know under a siege since i don't know 2005 or something so it was totally blockaded no one could really get in or out and you know of course palestinians on both territories don't have their own airport they don't have their own seaport. They don't control their own borders. They don't have their own currency. So they're totally stuck there, you know? So it's a different kind of domination. Whereas the West Bank, you have Israeli settlers living within the West Bank, and you have the IDF controlling it and patrolling it. And there's kind of different levels of armed violence that we saw in Lebanon. There is There were some camps that I, as an American citizen, couldn't enter because the Lebanese army um, has an agreement to itself not enter any of the camps, but some have different levels of security clearance or something. So some, they were like, if something happens, we can't retrieve you from the camp. So it's their own liability. So I couldn't go into some of them, um, whereas Mala could as a Lebanese citizen. But um, And then in terms of security, we also went to Jordan, where there's Palestinian refugee camps in Jordan, but because of the kind of governmental situation there, people weren't really willing to speak to us openly. So we didn't use it at all in the feature film because we didn't get the kinds of footage and interviews and collaborations we wanted. It's in some of the shorts, but um, that's a different kind of security concern. And obviously Syria, as I was saying, you know, was in the midst of the civil war and a number of camps were destroyed and evacuated have been since the civil war has been emerging. So yeah, there's different levels or fronts to it, let's say. Um, but yeah, the West Bank was where we witnessed ourselves. Malik was detained in a camp in Bethlehem, Was got caught up in clashes. Um, yeah. Uh, so I see a couple more questions. I'm gonna ask a question. Uh, it's a question about the distinction between self-representation and the reframing of self-representation via the construction of the film. 
And then the person uh, over here somewhere who asked the question about the distinction between the uh, Indigenous American reservation context and the Palestinian camp context actually made me aware of these two distinct variations of self-representation that occur. Uh, in the Palestinian context, not in each of them, and I recognize each one is its own unique representation, uh, there is a sense of uh, self-determination that leads towards the future, uh, that leads towards complex subjecthood formulation in the form of a modern citizen of the world. In the uh, indigenous reservation context, many of the perspectives that are put forward that are self-represented constitute uh, the notion of a return. And uh, I would, I imagine you don't individually advocate for this very overplayed out version of reifying representations of indigenous individuals as being in touch with nature and facing backwards such that an indigenous person in America can't, can never enter uh, the modern context because their entire identity is bound up by some kind of past sublime notion of being. And so I'm wondering how you kind of contend with that tension between uh, the, the methodologies of representation in documentation that you have articulated and the articles and the interviews you, know, you speak to very prevalently about uh, and how that might in some instances present a representation of an indigenous person that could be viewed in some instances as stereotypical. Yeah, I mean, I think in both cases, the reservations of the refugee camps are both kind of colonial governmental administrative entities or bodies that not, aren't, were not and are not necessarily chosen by the peoples who live there. In some cases, the reservations represent remnants of historical traditional homelands in other places they represent forms of displacement you know the people's the reservation where people live on might not be where they were from but just where they ended up or where they were put or where they were stuck so part of what we were doing is documenting these places one as outsiders as american and lebanese citizens were not we're neither native nor palestinian and we don't, we never claim to be such, but we, we were interested in documenting these places because citizens don't go there. They don't know where, where they are, what they are, what they look like, who lives there, how many there are, how many people live in them, what do the buildings look like, what do the houses look like, et cetera, just on a basic document, you know, documentation level, you know. And then part of it, part of the project or the question for us was like, on the one hand, we want to aestheticize those experiences or something to, to make them to showcase the moments of beauty or poetry or kind of potentiality within them, while also not romanticizing them, while also showing the kind of difficulty or hardship, in some ways, abjection, you know. Um, and I think in the Native case, that's harder because there's a dynamic where you see these wide open rolling hills and landscapes. You might think, oh, that looks really beautiful. You know what I mean? But it's it's a little harder to kind of visualize rural peripheral poverty. Whereas if you see the refugee camps, it's this dense, impoverished, overcrowded, underdeveloped, under-resourced place with electrical lines, you know, open sewage overly crowded, you know, crude building materials, et cetera. So it's it's more obvious, you know, when you see that, you say, this isn't good. Whereas you see the reservations, you might think, oh, this looks really beautiful. But, you know, as they talk about, they're, they've become polluted, they've become toxic, they're, they're sites of extraction, 
of different resources, resources that are then used by settler populations for electricity, for water, for uranium, for coal, to kind of power, to, to electrify, you know, Buffalo or New York City, et cetera. So how do you visualize that? You know, how do you visualize what might look like a beautiful lake or a river, but something that has been polluted and, and, and you know, made toxic or something? And, and what does it mean to live next to that place where it, on a certain urban metropolitan gaze could seem idyllic or something, but we kind of know in reality through environmental racism, et cetera, you know, that the, what might appear to be idyllic is actually quite harsh and kind of the distance from functional economies, fun, functional health infrastructure, educational, you know, resources, access, et cetera, you know, that, that, that being made peripheral is a different form of colonization than being made cramped in a refugee camp or, you know, as we're seeing in Gaza, just being architecturally devastated, you know, is, is what we're seeing the last four months or something. There's a certain ease within which you can see what's happening in Gaza and say, okay, obviously, you know. Whereas when you look at Aquasazne and you look at that river and you look at the kind of these different, these different, and they speak about it more directly in the Navajo segment, you know, these kind of environmental extractive, you know, dynamics and the, the asthma, the lack of clean water, the lack of electricity within those communities. How do you, how do we visually represent that and want to showcase that there is beauty within that, but, you know, and, and more conceptually, even aside from a visual phenomenon, to show that these places are ones of historic trauma and domination, but they remain spaces of dense self-organization, of dense subjecthood, identity formation, resistance, resilience, struggle, et cetera, as opposed to assimilating within to settler society or in the Palestinian case, assimilating into the erasure of Palestinian nationhood or something, you know, basically to leave Gaza or to leave the West Bank or to leave the camp as as they speak about in the film means to cease being Palestinian in many ways, you know, um, at least from the Israeli perspective. Um, so yeah, that was part of our struggle in thinking those questions through is how do we how do we showcase or visualize or aestheticize those those dual experiences of potentiality, but also historic, you know, domination or something. Um, and we chose to do it in these sites of the reservation, the camp, which are not necessarily, you know, of course, they're not chosen sites that these communities, you know, and in that sense, representation is also colonial because they were put there, they've wound up there because of the state formation around them or something. So, yeah, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So first of all, thank you. Um, I was going to say that um, this is less of like a question and more of like a comment. Um, I really appreciate the way that you represented everything that you showed, because I feel like, um, especially in the USA, um, people like think of activism as like um, traumatizing themselves for the people that they are representing and like, seeing work that kind of diverts from that is very important. Um, and like, I'm sorry, I'm very nervous. <laughs> um, I was also going to say that uh, just like the uh, whole idea of um, like the represent, like what you were saying a while ago about um, representing like the stories of people through like colonizers etc um i feel like uh i'm jamaican so that's very important to me about um like trying to get like your version of like a story out there compared to like the version that like people who have colonized you like the version of the well the version of the story that they put out there so the um whole idea of you going into these places and like letting people tell their own stories was very um, refreshing. Um, I also wanted to um, ask, 
if there was like anywhere online that you can go and like see the film because I really want to like write about it or like reference it in like any future assignments because I'm taking other classes um, that cover colonialization, especially settler colonialization. So I just wanted to know that. Thank you. Yeah, no, thanks for your comment and thoughts. Uh, we, the project, the broader project that the film is under is called The Native and the Refugee. And we have a website, it's thenativeandtherefugee.com. And there's a Facebook page, an Instagram page where all of our short films and our writings are there. This film itself is not publicly available, um, but I can share it with you as a link to, to watch it or, or you know whatever, maybe if, I don't know if you're in the class, but the, you know they have access to, to the film if you wanna rewatch it and you know whatever. But yeah, no, thank you for sharing. I think that's a really nice place to end. Thank you for that observation, comment, slash question. Matt, thank you so much. Thank you guys. Yeah. Uh, for everyone in the class, give me just a sec to open up your sign out portal and just one moment.